direction. Yes, yes sir. Yes. Okay, good, good. Now, are there any of you here today, now I'm going to take it personal, that's slow? Now, I don't know how you know if you're sleeping, but I'm just going to just go with it. It'll make sense in a minute. Now, I know there's one or two people here that have some heart issues. Am I right? The heart ain't what it used to be. It may not pump as hard as it used to. Matter of fact, the one or two of us that had some surgery, so we know yeah. that our heart ain't what it used to be. Right. Yeah, Let's take it even a little deeper. Is there any of you here who have had cancer of any sort? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Is there any of you here today who have ever had uh, a broken bone? Yes. yes, sir. Or some tore up ligaments? You know, ragged knees. Yes. Yes. Your back ain't what it used to be. Uh, uh, but here's the question. Now you say you yes to all these questions. My answer or my question to you is, how did you know? How did you know you had high blood pressure? How did you know you had diabetes? How did you know you tore up something when you thought it was just a, uh, you were just a sprain in your knee? So in other words, I'm asking is, how did you find out about the medical condition that you had? And the answer is simple. Somebody had some facts. Some evidence and some proof, and they told you about your condition. Yes. You ain't self-diagnosed. You can go Google all you want to, mm -hmm. but until someone puts some stuff together and you see it for yourself, mm -hmm. you I ain't got blood pressure, but the numbers say, oh, I, that's because I got white coat syndrome. Mm -hmm. Folk would tell me that. I'm like, you see this blood pressure, bro? You about to die. You talk about this because my white coat. Okay, but well, just know. Evidence will show you and tell you about your condition. A diabetic person will say, I don't have diabetes. So they have a test called A1C, which takes a test over a couple of months. So you know that day you could have not ate for two days. Anything sugar, so your numbers are beautiful. But there's this test going to tell the whole story, whether you like it or not. So my point is there's some things that you didn't know or some things that you had no clue about that you needed to take care of. <laughs> and you couldn't take care of it if you didn't know that something was wrong. Right. So if you found out and you found out that something's wrong, you now said, let me take care of the problem that I have. Mm -hmm. But you don't even know you have a problem until someone gives you the proof yes. that you do. Am I right? Yes. Right. People, y'all don't have about hearing people cough. Especially my, I'll say my seasoned veterans. We don't call them old, just seasoned veterans. Mm -hmm. Because you could be walking around with what you consider a nagging cough. Mm -hmm. But in essence, you walk around with bronchitis or pneumonia or double pneumonia on the verge of death. Because our older group will wait till they're on their deathbed and resurrection before they go see a doctor. Mm -hmm. So understand, I'm real particular when I hear people cough. Because I know sometimes you will wait. I heard about so and so. You're in the hospital, what happened? had that cough. What I'm saying is until you get it checked out mm -hmm. you will never believe oh this is just a cough. I had this cough for about eight, nine weeks. Mm -hmm. How long are you supposed to cough? Mm -hmm. Or the, there's an old saying <laughs> that, that's kind of go, uh, what you don't know won't hurt you. Mm -hmm. Now that being said for folks that have diabetes heart disease high blood pressure. Does that make sense to you now? Because yes. if you don't know that you have high blood pressure, diabetes, pneumonia, or cancer, it will hurt you and eventually kill you. So what I'm saying is, it sounds good, but you don't know it won't hurt you. That ain't true for every case. Because sometimes what you don't know about your situation, your issues, your problems, yeah. it will hurt you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you don't know your condition and problems will get worse. Am I right? Yeah. So in other words, if you leave something untreated long enough, mm -hmm. it's going to get worse mm -hmm. and worse. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is uh, understand that there's some things that we're gonna, I'm going to deal with today that's going to let you know if a person doesn't know that there's something wrong with them, mm -hmm. they're never going to get it 
treat. Yes. That makes sense? Yes. So, now with all they said, let's go with other sermons. We're going to put them all time in together. First sermon we did, why are you here? When I asked, why are you here? What is the purpose of you coming? Because if you can't even tell somebody what is the hope that's in you as to why, you can't answer the question as to why you're here, then why are you here? The next thing we ask, I brought up, which is if you catch him, he'll clean him. Talking about you being a fisher of men or a fisher of women, your job is to use the right bait, which is God's bait, which is the gospel. But make sure that your bait is minnows and not piranhas. Because you know that if you, you can catch something or you can kill them by what you say. All right, so, but understand that it's not your job to clean folks up. Here's what I mean. When Jesus said uh, in Matthew 13, talked about uh, he's going to separate the good from the bad fish. So the separator is the only one that can clean. It ain't your job to clean. Your job is to get them in the boat. Then last week we did this. No excuses, reasons, or explanations will be accepted. Meaning on the day of judgment, if you haven't went out there and spread the gospel, you're going to be like that one talent man. In the end, unprofitable servant. Some folks feel like I done got baptized, I'm in, let me sit down. And that's all I got to do. Uh, we, the young man was sitting there, he said, faith without works. He told the James this morning, y'all yes. missing out on something. Yes. Faith without works is dead. So we need to understand that there's some things that we as a church, Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, two things that the church, our purpose is we have to see, evangelism and make disciples. To evangelize and make disciples disciples. It doesn't make a difference how perfect things are. Your job is to either be a seed thrower or water boy. God gives the increase. Our text today, Romans 10th chapter, 11 through 17. Romans 10th chapter, verse 11 through 17. Tells us, oh, let me just read. I want to read all that. That's what he did, huh? Yeah, 10, 11, 17. <laughs> For with the heart, the man believes unto righteousness. And with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him who they've not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they've not heard? And how that they shall hear without a preach? How shall they preach except they be sent? And it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace, bringing glad tidings of, bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. Well, Isaiah said, Lord, <coughs> who hath believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, excuse me, and the hearing by the word of God. So I want you to take for subject time this morning, why are they not here? We know why we are here, but why are they not here? Now we know there's several reasons why they are not here in the assembly right now. Worshiping God in spirit and the truth. But today I'm going to deal with one of those reasons which I consider the main reason why most people are not here today. I'm talking about, I can't talk about other congregations. I'm going to talk about 212 Ellis Street. Why are they not here? But of course, before I can go there, I need to explain the text first. Make sure we're all on the same page. Because people have taken this text and maybe say stuff they don't say. So let's see what it says first, and then it'll make sense we'll get a bit later. Now keep in mind, the medical conditions I brought up versus if they don't know, they won't do anything to fix it. So, the setting, let's matter of fact, let's give it to the setting. Paul was one of the people, he gets a setup. Romans chapter 1, Paul is charging um, all of mankind, saying they're guilty before God, but specifically the Jews in particular. He informs us that through creation, God reveals the divine nature to mankind, and men should receive this revelation and respond by worshiping him. But instead, in verse 25, he says, these men, instead of worshiping him, they exchange the truth of God for a lie 
and chose to worship the create, create creature rather than the creator. Chapter 2, Paul in, um, he indicts the Jews, particularly for taking pride in their possession of the law, but failing to practice the law. In other words, he's saying, y'all got the book, but you don't even do what the book says. Chapter 3 and chapter 4, uh, he shows that law keeping can't save nobody. You have to read it to understand what he's trying to explain. They were so caught up in the law keeping thinking that they could be saved. In other words, everybody is going to not keep the law perfectly. So law keeping won't save you. So the law actually reveals that men are sinners and technically we all condemn to die. Salvation must come apart from men and law keeping. He wants them to understand that salvation is provided by God through Christ. You can't be saved by keeping the law. Only Jesus saves. Chapter 5 through 8, Paul, um, he goes to explain God's provision for righteousness in Jesus and his implications. And then, of course, at the end of chapter 8 of Romans, we all know this one, um, he encourages readers and assures them that, secure, that they are secured in God's sovereign plan. He calls us all things to work together to accomplish his purpose. It ain't about what you want. It's about what God wants. Amen. So sometimes you're going to have to go through some things that you can't understand. Why me, Lord? Well, there's a plan that you're a part of. You may not know it right then. Ask Joseph. Do you think Joseph was happy when he was sitting there in prison and he'd done nothing wrong? You think Joseph was happy when he got thrown by his own brothers in a pit and sold? But there's a bigger plan. So it has nothing to do with you, but it has everything to do with you and how you act. So remember, God had a plan that is according to his purpose for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. Chapters 9 through 11. Um, that's again an example of God's sovereign control of history. Paul uses chapter 9 through 11 um, to explain the purpose for the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, during this time frame that Paul was doing writing the letter, the Gentiles were coming to faith in Jesus in great numbers. Now remember, the, the, the gospel was supposed to be to the Jews first. But they weren't really taking on this Jesus dude, but the Gentiles were. So Paul was making a point to say, I need you to understand that it's for there is, chapter, um, chapter 10, verse number 12, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich unto all upon whom call upon him. So, we get in our chapter 10, we understand that Paul is saying, well, let me go to verse 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Paul wants them to know that everybody is invited mm -hmm. to be saved. Sometimes in the church, we get in this mindset, I call it the Jonah Syndrome, where everybody's a Ninevite, and the only people you won't save is your people who you won't save. But that's a folk that you don't care if they get saved or not. So you know different from the Jews who are like, well, the Gentiles, they ain't nobody. Why are you going to save them? Why would you save those type of people? And never reflect to see how sorry and raggedy you were. But God saved you anyway. So verses 14 through 21, well, actually the first 13 verses, uh, Paul explains that being sincere and having a zeal for God ain't enough. <clears throat> Chapter 10, verses 1 through 13, Paul explains that being sincere and having a zeal for God ain't enough. It takes more to it. So in order for men to be saved, uh, they need to believe the truth about Jesus Christ, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. There are some people who believe that there is Jesus. But it's not the same as believing in Jesus. The biggest, um, you ever watch the awards? And you'll see the person, I'd like to thank God for this gift that I gave. He just got the cuss of nine, ten, eleven words in his song. He just sang. But he'd like to thank God for the gift he gave me to do that. No, you going to put God with that. No. But people know of God. But they don't know who God really is. Verses 14 through 21, Paul is demonstrating that both the Jew and the Gentile can be saved, and there's no excuse for Israel's unbelief. He's saying the Jews have no reason not to believe that Jesus is who he is. But I'm not going to 
to get deep into that because it'll take away, because that'll take, that's all left about seven. But understand verses 11 through 17, I'm going to show you a principle here that we're going to extract and we're going to expound on and we're going to use as a reason as to why they are not here. The answer we need to know as to why those people out there are not here is right here. So in order to explain, let me explain this first. They here, I'm talking about anyone that is not a child of God. The they that I'm referring to is the same thing. We're talking about those people in the world who are lost. There are some things that are lost and who are not in here today. They are the people who have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's who they are. Because you know you hear somebody that say, well, you know they said so and so. Who's that? Because I asked in the heart, who's that? Well, you know some. They said, who is that? If you say they around me, I'm going to ask you who they are. Well, you know they say, who is they? They say. Because well, we just make up stuff in our mind and put it on they, and they ain't said nothing. Let me move on. That's the whole thing I said, who they is. But the they we're talking about is those who are not saved. And the here, I'm only speaking about to want to illustrate. I can't talk about why other people are not at the other church of Christ, but I can talk about why they're not here. The principle still applies, but we need to understand why are they not here on Sunday and why are they not here on Wednesday night. The main reason that I believe that they are not here is because they do not know, they don't comprehend, and they don't understand that they're lost. Understand what I'm saying. The reason why most folk are not here right now in our community is because they don't know that they're lost. They can't understand that they are lost. There are people walking around today and they don't realize that they are in a dangerous, spiritual, unsaved condition. Now think about that as if I said, you have cancer. Walking around thinking everything is fine, not knowing that what's inside of you is eating you alive and killing you. Now we can understand that when it comes to those things, but when it comes to the gospel, how come they don't know? Well, how come you didn't know that you had cancer? Because until you are given facts and evidence and something opens your eyes to what the truth is, you're walking around about to die and don't even know it. So when one doesn't know that they're lost, guess what? They will never seek to be found. That makes sense? I don't need to be found if I don't know I'm lost. I don't want to go to the doctor for I ain't sick. The whole time you're dying and don't even know it. There are signs and symptoms we get all the time, but we'll just blow them off because it, no, it don't make sense. Uh, whatever. It's just an ache or pain here. Just like my dumb behind sitting here thinking I got indigestion. I got the signs, but again, God had to use somebody to make me upset, to get me hot, so I could shut them up. And all the while, he said, I need the pawns to get on you, because I, you ain't going to listen to nobody else. But to keep them from saying that next week, guess what you're going to do? And I stopped taking them jalapenos and my chest pains got worse. <laughs> that let me know it's time to pay attention to the signs. But I'm walking around thinking I'm all right. Not knowing, <laughs> brother, you're going to die. But I can say, until you get some evidence, that's why I just get a blood test, let me get this done so I can get over it and say I got our, our blood pressure, or whatever it is. Mr. Washington, you have uh, blocked arteries. What do you mean? The test confirmed. It showed them gone. <laughs> Next thing is you want to have surgery tomorrow or do you want to have it uh, Monday? Is it that serious? Now I knew it was that serious. But until I got it in my mind it was that serious, I was like, well, let me, let me think about it. Think about it when you present the gospel to folk. I said the same thing, guess what you They're saying the same thing. Let me think about it. So if someone doesn't know that they're in need of the gospel, if they don't know that they're lost, they'll never see Jesus to be found. If we go to the parable of the lost sheep, which is in what, Luke 15? I believe because Jesus didn't say anything, but the sheep don't know that they're lost. That sheep that was lost, there's no way that sheep was lost and was lost and knew it was lost. He's talking about man. Where they at? That ain't what he said. 
said that sheep was doing what it always do, not knowing was lost, just like that inanimate coin. That coin didn't know it was lost, but it was lost. And the point what Jesus was trying to make is to say that, that they didn't know that they were lost, but somebody made a conscious effort to thoroughly search and find something valuable, that which was lost. So souls that are out there, lost, they're valuable to God. God wants his souls back. Satan done stole them. But we can go out there and at least let them know that they're lost. And we know that at the end of the, uh, each parable that Jesus gave us, said, um, the people who found the coin and found the sheep, they rejoiced. They were happy that they found that which was lost. Man. So just like medical conditions that I mentioned earlier, you would have never known that you had an illness. You would have never known that you had a problem. You would have never known that you needed help until you were informed of your condition. We walk around and think that, that there's nothing wrong with us. And actually, I realized and I was sitting there thinking, I don't even remember age 25. I really don't remember age 35. But I do know I'm going to hit five zero shortly. And I kept thinking, where did the years go? Yep. And then um, Sister Mayo talking about, you walk around here all fast. I'm thinking, yeah, you're right. Let me get it over with now because I know, Lord, let me live long enough. It's going to take me shorter walks. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is, until I know that something's wrong with me, I'm never going to seek help. So if you leave your medical conditions untreated, it's going to get worse. So what do you think about people who are unsaved? Do you not realize how worse and worse they keep getting? Yes. Just watch TV. I watched something this morning at a funeral. Somebody got shot and killed at a funeral. Tell me the world ain't getting worse and worse. Yes. But if a person doesn't know that they're lost, they're never going to seek help to be found. And so you can't believe what you don't know won't hurt you if you believe there's a heaven and there's a hell. Because if there's a hell that we can go to, what you don't know will hurt you in the end. So the thing is, Satan wants to convince you and everyone else of the greatest, or well, one of the greatest lies, or one of the greatest deceptions that he's ever told is that what you don't know won't hurt you. It won't. Ah, oh, ain't nothing wrong with that. Go ahead. It's okay. Just a little bit won't do too much. But that's why she said a little level. Level's a whole lot. Because sometimes all you need, say just don't remember, he's not going to tempt you with something that you ain't bothering you. And I was like, I make a joke about this, but I need to tell the truth. That's some things that I've done in my life. And somebody said, boy, you don't done everything but lick light, man. So when people present stuff to me, that doesn't impress me. It doesn't even, it's like you're wasting your time. But disrespect me. Say some short mouth words to me. Try to be slick with me. I, I get this little feeling in me. I'm getting better, but it's still there. So in other words, Satan ain't going to bother you with something that he know don't bother you. Satan ain't going to bring no alcohol around me because he's like, oh, it's going to sit there and sit there. If, if you ever open it, so by the time somebody else finally comes and comes to my house, I'm dead and gone. Oh, this is the bottle that's been here for some odd years. He never opened it, showed me, because that doesn't move me. But Satan knows what would eventually hurt you? All you need is just a little sip of a little touch on But Satan says, if I can convince you that what you don't know won't hurt you, we should remind you 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, verse 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 4, chapter, 3 and 4. But even if our God's gospel, one version says, be veiled, if it be hid, it is here to avail to those who are perishing. Wait a minute. So people who don't know, who can't see the gospel, Paul said they're perishing. Whose minds the God of this age has blinded. If it's such good this morning, you heard the apostle talk about the God of this world, the God of this, the God of age. The God of this age who has blinded, who do not believe. So people who don't believe are perishing because the gospel is hidden. Lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine on them. Satan knows 
how to cloud your vision to things. So you mean to tell me my numbers, I'm going to go back to the blood pressure thing because I hear it all the time. My numbers is 170 something over 98. Oh, that's just white coat syndrome. I'm wearing blue scrubs. What are you talking about? Somebody don't know what I'm talking about. Well, folks get their blood pressure, the number's high. They'll claim it's because I'm in the doctor's office in a white coat. Well, I'm not wearing white. I'm wearing blue. Me and you doing fine. You've been sitting here about 10 minutes. Your blood pressure's high. Well, does the blood pressure run in your family? Yeah. Did your mom didn't have it? Yeah. Did your dad have it? Yeah. How about your grandparents? Both of them on both sides. But you don't think you got blood pressure? No. <laughs> Just like folk, you can show them the truth. No, but you can't make somebody believe the truth, even if it's right there in front of them. So I'm like, do you not see your blood pressure this high? So you try to say we're gonna have surgery? That's all right. You go to the doctor come in. I know that the blood ain't gonna touch you. Because the anesthesia ain't gonna touch you. Ain't nobody gonna touch you with the blood pressure. Because guess what? All you gotta do is have a, a heart attack or a stroke right there on the table. They knew that your, your stuff wasn't right. So why would we? The point is, you can show somebody. In black and white, green and white, red and white, blue and white, whatever and white. And the truth is right in front of them. But everybody ain't going to believe. But uh, the Satan blinds people to say, it's just my blood. I'm, I'm not feeling good. My stress is up. Okay. But 1 Timothy 4th chapter, 1 Timothy 4th chapter, verses 1 through 3. We know it talks about, y'all remember that spirit, 1 Timothy 4th chapter, verse number 3. We'll throw this out there in the next sentence. Now the Spirit speaking expressly that in the latter time, now time, some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of demons or devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidden to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God had created and received with thanksgiving to them who believe and now and who know the truth. That truth again, people act like they don't know. So Satan is blinding the minds of folk today through science. And here's one of them. There's a doctrine of atheism. Y'all know what that is, right? There is no God. No such thing. Big bang theory. Then there's a doctrine of evolution. We ain't nothing but animals. We came from a monkey, and a monkey did this, and a monkey did that. The next thing a monkey did something. Monkey see, monkey do all oh, monkey monkey. <laughs> it's just the foolishness, but People believe that that because they can't say you got a blind it. How can a bumblebee fly the way it does and a hummingbird who is aerically, dynamically unreal to be able to hold itself up still can do it? There's a sea. I'm trying to remember the name of the sea that literally one sea and another sea meet together. You can see the line where it stops. There's no way possible that land and man and something just happened. Matter of fact, I haven't told you when tonight. You can see the line where the water of the ocean stops and the sea stops. You can taste water on this side salty and water on this side ain't salty. I'm like, you kidding? That's God. But folks won't believe that. There's the evidence right there. What? No, my blood pressure ain't that high. It's something else. There's the doctrine of humanism, where man is the measure of all things. And in him, Man, we are the own solution to our own problem. We are the gods. We are basically God. We are our own God. And you got to go tell the people you're God. The God that you believe is the God that's in your mind, and that's the God. Then there's the doctrine of what I like to call controlism. This is the best one. This one they use the most. Well, the Bible is just a book to control mankind. You know how folks are doing that. The Bible is the white man's book to control the black man. The problem is the Bible was out before the white man read it. Amen. The book starts in Egypt. How did European get it? They didn't get it until Paul brought it to them. So the book was there before they came, but you're saying that the white man used it to control the black man, so it's a white man's book. But the book started in Egypt with the black man. Okay, I'm just confused. You know what I'm saying? Okay, but so what I'm saying is people will use things because they want to blind you to the truth. I heard, I'm going to call his name, I heard Farrakhan say Jesus is a Muslim. He said, I don't know why folks argue Jesus was a Muslim. I said, no, Jesus was a Jew. 
And I'm thinking, everybody, ah. Oh. I'm like, y'all, did y'all hear what he just said? Show me. When the Muslims out when Jesus was done, I'm like, man, when you listen, but people want to be blinded. And Satan is just telling them what they need, what they want to hear to make them feel good. But he's the king. The gospel being as good as it is and as glorious as it is, it doesn't mean that everyone's going to hear it. I don't care how you present it sometimes, everybody's not going to take the gospel as it is. And the thing is, it's not you that they are rejecting. Sometimes it is. We're going to deal with that in a few lessons later. But it's they're rejecting the message, not the, uh, not the messenger. Satan knows how to keep you from seeing who Jesus really is. So what Satan done is he's allowed people to be on TV to give this false sense of people. Yes. Because there's some people that I know said, I ain't coming to church because all y'all want is money. And I understand where they get it from. Because if you watch TV, <laughs> if you sitting there donation, I'll send you one of these. <laughs> I'll pray on it, I'll wipe my sweat on it and hand it to it. Boy, the foolishness. But Satan knows that if he keeps his doctrines out there, Folk could continue to be blinded by the truth. So it's important for all of us to understand that there's some consequences and repercussions. I watch the movie Life a lot, so it's going to be in my head. Consequences and repercussions of being spiritually lost. Because if we understand that there's some consequences, it's going to keep us straight. It'll keep us on the straight and narrow path of righteousness. Am I right? Okay, let's make sure now. Because some people out there, they don't, they don't know what I'm talking about. If your dad said, if you do this, everything will go away. But if you do that, I'm going to put it on. You remember days I'm going to beat the black off of you? You pretty much, you, you felt the lips, you thought some of the black came off. <laughs> Consequences and repercussions were not stand. So you know what? Some, that kept me from doing some of the foolishness that I, am I, no, you know what? I, that woman ain't worth that. <laughs> Ask yourself. <laughs> well, we know as long as that people, because that's why the world is the way it is now. Most children and most kids nowadays, they don't see any repercussions for what they do. That's why they do it. So if the people don't like the gospel, because the gospel has to correct you too. So it is God is a God of love, but it's also a God of correction too. As a matter of fact, my Bible says he corrects you or disciplines those whom he loves. So when one is truly lost, they're going to speak differently. They're going to talk differently. And they're going to um, um, act differently than the word of God wants them to be. They, and the thing is, they don't have any remorse. When I hear a person use the GD word, and I'm thinking, oh, did you just say that? Oh, man, come on. No remorse whatsoever using God's name in vain. Mm -hmm. Because that's not where they're at. They don't see a need to be remorseful. Because they don't understand that there's some consequences and repercussions on Judgment Day. Lost people don't know. But most importantly, you've got to come to the terms that you yourself was once lost just like they were. You acted like who? Somebody said that in Sunday school this morning. Hey, y'all going <laughs> Ephesians 2. Acted like him, spoke like him, and thought just like him. But we'll be the first one to them. I don't know why they do that. God, they talk like that. You don't forget how you used to talk. You see what she had on? I remember what you had on too. <laughs> you yourself was blinded by the God of this world just like they are. And don't let us forget that when you were in your lost and unsaved condition, think about it now. When you were lost and unsaved, where were you at on Sunday? This is me thinking about me now. I was like, ooh. Ooh, I know where I wasn't on Sunday. I wasn't him. Matter of fact, not only, that's a shame. I'm glad I got saved. But I was taking my son to do dirt with me. Oh, Lord. Because I used to go to car shows. My thing was car shows. So I would go all the way to Georgia on Sunday, car shows. I love bowling. Went on bowling tournaments on Sunday. Man, I ain't nothing about y'all in church. All y'all want is money. That's the mindset that I was in. And then when I wasn't going out doing anything, before I became a child of God, I was recovering from Saturday night. Some of y'all don't want to think about that. Oh, yeah. So what I was doing, and then thinking in my mind, sitting on the couch watching TV, thinking, how am I going to do it? Next weekend too. Yep. Now I don't know how much money I got, but I need to start putting some stuff together so I can try to manipulate how dirt we're gonna do next week. I know I ain't the only one that did it, but just know that we knew on Sunday that's a day of rest. 
The Bible says God rested on Saturday. And when somebody told me that, my feelings were so hurt. I said, oh, wait, dude, don't. Yeah, he'd been saying that for a couple of years. I thought he rested on Saturday and Sunday. No, bro. He rested on Saturday. Word, think about it now. On Sundays, back when you out there lost, where you were church. Just something to think about. So be mindful when you're judging everybody else for not doing what they're doing. So the question is, why are they not here? It's because they're lost. They don't know. They don't understand or comprehend or grasp the idea that Jesus is their Savior. And he has done something that no one else could do in order that they could be saved. But the thing is, if people don't know that, Luke 19.10, Luke 19.10, the Son of Man has come to seek and save that which was lost. If someone doesn't tell me that Jesus, all people know about is Jesus and a picture on the wall. I'll pray to Jesus when you need something. Not understanding, I mean, think about it. How many of us have actually sat down and said, did you know Jesus actually died for your soul? That Jesus actually came on this earth and he actually knew that Stuff was going to happen and he still died knowing that he was going to die the way he died. Think about that one person that we, when, that person that we love. When we talk about them, notice how you talk about them. You, you want everybody to love them like you love them. It's the same thing. How are you presenting Jesus? Because some people don't realize that they're lost in what Jesus has done to them. We go done for them. Which means lost folk don't realize they need to be saved. Therefore, they'll never seek a savior. for people with cancer don't know that they need to go see a doctor until someone shows them that there's something wrong with them. So just like most folk that don't know that they need saving until somebody gives them the evidence and the facts and lets them know that they need to be saved. Remember, everybody's not going to accept the gospel, but the point is, have you presented them the gospel. So in essence, lost folk are unsaved folk, still dead in their trespasses. So lost folk, we know they're blind about Satan. They're unsaved folk. And not only do they, they're unsaved, they don't realize what Jesus has done for them. But they're also, as we read earlier, they're perishing. So we got blind, blinded folk, unsaved folk, and perishing folk. Excuse me, John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So lost folk are blinded folk, unsaved folk, perishing folk who do not realize that they are under the wrath of God as well. Remember I told you about those consequences. John 3rd chapter verse number 36. John 3rd chapter verse number 36. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life. We're still talking about those people that believe now. But he who does not believe the Son shall not see light, but they're going to see the wrath of God abides on him. So that's consequences. But if they don't know, all thing they know is, does Jesus do what y'all go see? Y'all claim every Sunday. But how many people know that there's a heaven and hell? I told you, when I go visit people for the first time, all I want to know is the first question, which is, bro, please tell me, that's a heaven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you believe that's a hell too? If they say yes, now you know where they are. But if they tell you no, well, no. For John 3, 36, it says, if you believe, then there's a wrath of God. So what do you not think the wrath of God is? We have to let them know. You have to get, just like you can tell somebody they got cancer. Oh, no, I don't have it. No, just doctor, we do it again. This is the stuff that I have to deal with with people who've been smoking for 40 years and drinking for 30, and they got throat cancer. They deny it because it's like they can't believe. No, but you have to keep telling them. We're going to have to do this, and God, we've got to show you that this is what it is. And once they see it, are you sure can you read it? I want to get a second opinion. All the opinions in the world ain't going to change what's wrong. Because people are telling you, the Church of Christ, they ain't the only way to be saved. Go get a second opinion. But make sure if you don't get a second opinion, go to a specialist. Someone who can divide the word right. Yeah. And when you find out, because that's how I found out, the church of Christ is right. Because I want a second opinion. Somebody gonna tell you you ain't church, you're going to hell. I want a second opinion. 
So I went into the specialist and then called myself, let me find out that what they told me is a lie. Because people would deny. I ain't got a blood pressure. I'm going to take some herbs or some spices. Well, the man, he, the, the government has set it up so you don't take medicine and they take medicine. There's three things I'm going to tell you don't ever fool with. Don't ever mess with your blood pressure, your heart problem, and diabetes. Don't fool with them three. If they give you some medicine and it works, you better take it. You better go fool with them uh, herbs and spices. If you know people who lived 108 years old and they took it, guess what? Uh, it, the side effects. The side effects everything. Eat orange. I got read one. But it's good for you. So what I'm saying is that things that people will try to reason in their mind, no, oh, it can't be so. So the wrath of God is an expression for the judgment of God. On the day of judgment, if you don't let these people know on the day of judgment, you're going to bust hell wide open. They'll never know. Why are they not here? Because they're lost, blinded, and they do not know that they're unsaved, perishing, and under wrath of God. But what, what most importantly that we don't realize, and I didn't realize until I did the study was, not only are they all these things, they're condemned already. When I saw it, it kind of threw me. I was like, John 3, 18. John. Third chapter, verse number 18. John. Third chapter, verse number 18. He who believes in him is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. So you mean to tell me if I have not obeyed the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm already condemned to hell. We don't, how many times have we actually read that and it stood out and said, wait a minute. I, you know I told you? You don't have to do anything to go to hell. There it is. You don't have to do anything to bust hell wide open, but he who believes is not condemned. Believes in him, him being Jesus, is not condemned. But he who does not believe is condemned already. So if you want to go to hell, you're not going to die. Absolutely nothing. Because he who has, does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son, or because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son. So Jesus is saying right here that the lost folk are condemned already. Jesus is trying to tell you, do you believe in me? If you don't do what I say, why call me Lord and don't do the things I told you to do? Yeah. Folk love the Savior. Jesus is my Savior. Jesus loves my heavenly king. But let him talk about Lord. Lord means you have to be submissive. You got to do what he said. But I want to do it my way. Some folks cannot grasp the idea because they're under the impression. Here's the thing. This was me. This is why I know people believe this. That when we die, if you're unsaved, what happens is we got to go before God. You know, because you get the, the idea that we want to stand before the judgment seat. He's going to weigh our good deeds and our bad deeds. The Bible says you're going to be judged by what's good and what's bad, right? So we believe that that's what we're going to do. We're going to stand before the judgment seat. Talking about Peter, can you hook me up? Please let the gate trouble, man. Bro, you know you got gate trouble. You got gone over there. And then after the Jesus God weighs it, this, the ways our good and bad deeds, if our good deeds outweigh our bad deeds, we're going to make it happen. That's why. And I'm going to tell you the reason why I'm telling you that people believe this. It's because some of the biggest drug dealers and criminals and thugs and thieves will do more for people than folks in the church will. They will get out and feed folk, people that need stuff. They will break their neck to do it because in their mind, if I do some good stuff, real big good stuff, it outweighs the bad stuff I'm doing. Because I know folk who believe just like that. And it used to make sense to me. But when you understand, oh, you're some damn dog at it. Oh. So I don't care how goodness ain't going to get you into heaven. But we believe in it and say, okay, so if, if, if the bad part outweighs the, the, the good part, then I'm going to hell. Okay. So what let me do, let me continue to be good and do good things. That means being good ain't going to save nobody from going to hell. That's what we need to understand. Because it also, it deal with not coming to church is a whole other lesson, but people believe that. Did you know? I'll say it this way. If people who believe that I'm a Christian, I don't need to go to church. Here's what you're saying. I was going to say this to another lesson, but I'll drop it off. That's like saying, um, Brother Belford, I love you, man. You're my boy. But I can't come by your house because I don't like your wife. <laughs> Listen to what I just said. I can't stand church folk, but I love Jesus. But a bell, but I love you, but I can't stand your wife. <laughs> but you got some stuff for me at your house, and if I want to get it, I got to come there. But because I don't like your wife, I ain't coming to your house. Bro, I got $10,000 for you. If you come by, I pick it up. I don't like your wife, I ain't coming to get it. 
You see the foolishness behind that? God got blessings for folk right here. But because you don't like somebody at the church, you don't come. Do y'all see what I mean? You can't say I love the husband and I hate the wife. Y'all understand that? That makes sense to you? Okay, because I'm just letting you know. So when folk claim you ain't got no church to be saved, and the reason why you don't go because you're mad at somebody, listen to what you're telling Jesus. Jesus, I love you, but I can't stand who you're married to. People will never know that they're unsaved unless they're given an informed um, opportunity to make the right decision. You have to give people the evidence. Give people the facts. But don't beat them up. My heart doctor, when he was talking to me, this dude, he, just, he made me mad because he was just too cool. Um, Dr. Brooks, Mr. Washington, um, letting you know that you have some stents, uh, you have some problems with your chest, and we need to have surgery, and uh, this, and he was just calm and cool. So I wait, wait, wait. So you try to tell me I need surgery? Yes, sir. Your heart is, um, you got, at least from the paperwork we got from the studies, it shows that you have two clock hours, two of them, at least about 95%. And, and I'm like, whoa, whoa, whoa. No inflection in the voice, he just let me calmly know you're gonna die, you're gonna need to do it, get it done tomorrow, get it done. What well, can I wait? Mr. Washington, now, really, how long are you talking about waiting? You mean wait till Friday afternoon? Because this was Thursday, or you wanna wait till Monday? What well, can I go talk to my kids? You have an opportunity to talk to them then if you like to step out. But you're gonna have surgery on tomorrow, you're gonna have it Monday. As calm as he was, my feelings was hurt, because I'm thinking, I'll be Say something, act like you're gonna die. But it still sank in my head thinking, if he's cool, he's calm about it. So he's trying to tell me, if he do this, he can save me. Okay, so he's saying that I'm going to be all right. Because he didn't have that look on his face like, I don't know how things go. He never said there was a 30% chance none of that. He said, you're going to be fine. You want to take some medicine after that. So the, the, the way he presented it to me was like, okay, well, let me tell my kids. And I debated my mind. He said, nobody in the church. Because I don't want nobody to come and see me. I told you, I'm like Brother TK. I want y'all to come see me. <laughs> Let me get right. Then I'm going to see y'all. Because I know I was going to look like a scrub. I always look like a scrub. But I was going to look really bad as a scrub. But it was just to say, I'll let them know when everything's fine. Well, you should ask somebody to pray for you. Yeah. But you're talking about me and I. We cry babies. We sisters. We, we're whining babies. And we don't want everybody to know that we're sick. So we won't tell nobody. I'm hard headed. I learned that the last time I do it, I'll do it the next time. But understand that if he hadn't given the evidence, if I hadn't seen the words, the stuff right there, thinking, wow, he's right. Because my EKG came back normal. Well, EKG means I'm going to have a bad heart, right? EKG was normal. So sometimes what you see, that may be good, but you need to see the other side. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you may present the gospel here, but sometimes you've got to show them the bad side too. That you're condemned already. So whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call upon him whom they've not heard believed? And how shall they believe on him whom they've not heard? How shall they hear without a preaching? How shall they preach unless they are sick? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings and good things. So no lost soul will ever call on the name of the Lord to be saved. Nor will they respond to the gospel if they never heard it. That's the thing. They have to hear the gospel. Joel, second chapter, verse number 32. Joel, second chapter, verse number 32 is where we get the text from. Verse number 13. So I need you to understand this. People have taken this word, this phrase that made it make say something that doesn't say. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Peter's quoting Joel, second chapter, verse number 32. But remember, Peter quoted the same thing in Acts, second chapter, verse number 21. So what does this phrase mean? To call upon the name of the Lord implies, simply implies, that the one who's calling upon their Lord is in trouble and is in great need of rescue. That's what it means. All that other stuff people have made and say, all he's saying is, you're saying, by calling upon the name of the Lord, you're in trouble. Because when you hear, dial 911, what does that mean? Somebody's in trouble and they need rescue. It's the same idiom. Exactly the same thing. But folks, they made say, all you got to do is touch the TV. Call the name of the Lord and trust them in your heart. That ain't what they say. But folks can tell you that's what it means. Now, also, to reinforce it, Paul says that when he uses the word saved, which means the person in trouble understands, this is you got The person that uses this means they understand that there's nothing that they can do to save themselves. And they're calling out on the one who they know can actually save them from this wrath condition. 
That's what it means. And we know there's nothing that we can do to save ourselves. So who do we call on if we want to be saved? Call on the one person who we know can rescue us. That's the beauty of what the text is saying. That's what Paul wants us to know is we got to call on Jesus. So when you apply this to spiritual terms and see that a person understands their consequences and their repercussions of their sins, they want to be rescued, delivered, and saved from their sins. And that's why you're still here today. But there are people out there that don't know they need to be rescued, and that's why they're not here today. So there's no magical phrase of someone telling you this, that this is what's going to happen. So, the author's intended meaning, talk about preachers here. How can they hear as the preacher tells them? Matthew 28, 19 and 20. Mark 16, 15. We all are teachers and preachers. Please understand, everybody is a fisher of meaning. So that means everybody should be using the same bait that everybody else is using. So Paul was using his first reading, he was explaining it to them, but we have to understand it means all of us have to share the gospel. Every last one of us. That's what he's trying to say. So, but here's the thing. We can't make the gospel, I don't care how good and how nice we present it, we can't always make the gospel acceptable. A-C-C-E-P-T-A-B-L-E, -E, acceptable. We can't make everybody want to accept it. All we have to do is make it available. Man. That makes sense? Man. Everybody's not going to accept these numbers saying you got how to work, but they don't accept it. That number says that, and that number says that, and this blood test says here, A1C says you got uh, diabetes. No! Uh, the test shows you have a core of knee for the MRI. No, that's just some stuff in there. That, that in my knee, they turned my knee on into the x-ray. I heard somebody say, look, man, that's your knee toe up. What's wrong with you? The evidence is right there. But just because you show it to them, everybody doesn't accept the truth. All you got to do is make it available so they can make an informed decision to either obey or not to obey. How do we know? But they, verse number 16, but they have not obeyed the gospel. Everybody ain't not going to obey the gospel. We know that, but you still got to make it available. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Have you planted least the seed? That's the question. Have you at least tried to water with somebody else's plant? The question is, why are they not here? Simply, the main reason folks are not here is because they cannot comprehend the consequences of their of what's really going to happen in the end. And until you came to the realization of that, you stayed out there too. Some of us, when we join church, I'm going to say join, because that's what we did. We joined church, and we acted a purity of food until finally the gospel shook us at one point, and we realized, you know what, I'm going to bust hell my Man, Let me get my life right. I know I'm the only one that did that, so I don't want to say, I'm glad I got one amen. He don't mind saying it. We're, being in, we, we know we weren't always saved, but amen. the gospel finally said, do you not realize what you're doing? And you woke up. They need to do the same thing. They need to hear the gospel. It shakes them. Because everybody that presents the, present the gospel is not going to fully understand it the first time. And they're not going to fully understand it as they have in the head. But the beauty of it is, remember, 1 Corinthians 6, verse number 9. It gives you this long list of people, but the one beauty of it is, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's the one thing. Under, let them read it in for themselves and find out the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. And when you in Christ Jesus, Romans 8, 1, the most beautiful, the most beautiful passage in the world, Romans 8, chapter verse number 1. <laughs> there is therefore no now, no condemnation in Christ Jesus. If you're not in, you're already condemned already anyway, but there's no more con condemnation in those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So you have to treat the gospel as if it's good news. It's some of the best news you've ever heard. We'll end up with this. This makes sense. There's an old story uh, about good news. And bad news. The good news is that one of you here have inherited a four bedroom home, 3,000 square feet, with a trust fund that pays all your utilities, your mortgage, your property tax, and, your, and it's on 10 acres of land. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this is what you inherited. 
Here's the pewter. And the person who had, that died is going to give you $5,000 a month to the day you die. Ain't that good news? If somebody went in, y'all here had that. So that'd be good news. But all you have to do is go to the lawyer's office and sign for it. That's all you got to do. Nothing else has to be done. Then that's good news, right? But here's the bad news. None of your friends or any of your family who knew about it told you about it. So you were still in that same four bedroom, that two, two, um, two square feet house, and that shack that you used to be. Your life hasn't changed at all. But your friends and your family knew, but nobody told you. It's still good news, right? But it ain't good news to you because you ain't done that. You don't even know that there's some good news. So even though it's good news, it's still good news. How good is the good news if you've never heard the good news? Boy, I hope that makes sense, because it sure came out like it did. But in other words, that is salvation, which is good news. There are people that don't know that that's good news, because we haven't told them about the good news. It's all bought and paid for. Your sins, everything is paid for. All you have to do is accept it. All you got to go and do is see. Jesus was that advocate. You just need to go see the Lord. Come on, somebody missed that. Go see our Lord who was an advocate who will, I got you. It's paid for. Your sins are done. He says, I prepared a place for you. And then he's got what? Many what? Many mansions. And if he didn't, if he, if he said it's there, then it's there. Because if he didn't say it wasn't there, then it wasn't there. But he said it's there. So there is good news. Yes. But the problem is, the Bible talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel, right? Mm -hmm. We got too many people mm -hmm. in the church got some other feet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, oh, now we're getting it. Some people got some toes that look like they're throwing up gang signs. <laughs> because you're not, your feet are not getting out there spreading the gospel. Mm -hmm. They sitting up with their feet crossed over watching TV doing absolutely nothing. If you're not, if nothing else, the one talent man, you remember he went to hell because he didn't do one thing with that one talent, which is the gospel. He hid it. Now remember, Satan veils and hides the gospel. That one talent man hid the gospel. So if you're not showing the gospel by your lifestyle, or at least telling it, you're hiding the gospel. You have to ask yourself. Why are they not here? Because they're blinded. They're lost, blinded, unsaved, perishing on the wrath of God, and condemned already. That used to be you. Yeah, yeah. How are your feet today? If we took your shoes off, mm -hmm. and we took a spiritual look at your feet, would they be beautiful? Would they be groomed? Would they be painted? Prince done? Would they be towed up from the floor? And you know whether or not you have been spreading the gospel. Or you've been out there spreading lies or spreading foolishness or spreading gum. It's time out to stop playing church. For coming to church, but we're playing church. Amen. If y'all can see the things that are going on in this world and let you know the world is getting worse and worse and worse. Yeah. And we're playing like we got tomorrow. <laughs> Jesus is coming back. I don't know if y'all know that. He's actually going to come back. Amen. And we don't know when he's coming back. Will you be ready? On the day of judgment, when your resume say you've done something, we're going to say, depart from me, you who work iniquity. So if you are here, and this is your first time or second time here, you are not a child of God. I want you to understand that if you are not a child of God, you're condemned already. Man. What am I saying? You already on your way to hell. That's what the scripture teaches. You are on your way full of speed, no left, no right, no detours to hell. But you can fix that. You don't have to go to hell. You have to come to the realization that the gospel is the good news about Jesus, who's the Son of God. He came to save your soul, my soul, and everybody's soul from hell, if you want to believe. But you got to believe he was crucified on the cross, buried, and rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Then you confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, repent of your sins, go on water, grave, baptism, therefore God will add you to the church. And if you're a member of the body of Christ and you realize you have not been living the way God wants you to live, you have not been sharing the gospel. You are already in trouble. So if anyone need to respond to the invitation to do so, we stand and sing.
verse of our invitational song. Your grace and mercy brought.